Good morning, church. We have, uh, I was just thinking as Jeff was giving the announcements, thank you, Jeff, for that, but how awesome it is that Amy and our music team like plays in the background. Doesn't it feel so relaxing? Like we could say, there's a million dollar shortfall here at the church, but you just feel so, I love it, man. Like, it's amazing. We, we have an incredible team of people. I'm so grateful for all of our worship team, uh, man, just to pour their hearts into the music like they do. Uh, so I just want to thank you for your dedication. We don't say that enough. Uh, but it's good to be here today. They, they are a real gift to our church family. And speaking of gifts, gifts under the Christmas tree are kind of like a promise, aren't they? You know, as parents, you buy a gift, you wrap it up, you put it under the tree, and there's this anticipation of the gift that what you're going to open is a good gift, right? No ugly sweaters. No ugly sweaters. Let, let me tell you one. I, we were at a family get-together. I'm not going to name any names, and this service is not recorded, so I feel safe in this one. I may cut this in the second service in case one of my family members watch, but I got a Christmas gift, and it was in a beautiful uh, package, like a bag, and probably had snowflakes or something on the side, had the tissue paper perfectly placed in the top. And I opened it up anticipating, you know, something cool, socks, you know, whatever, I don't know. Uh, it was toothpicks. <laughs> the little string toothpick things, the new thing that you have now, the toothpickers. That, that was a Christmas gift I got. And I felt great about that when I felt really good about that gift. But it took me back as I was thinking about gifts this week to my first Christmas when I was married to Leslie. We had a small apartment up in the Humble area, and it, it did not have a good microwave. And so she had been talking. We got married in September. So for months, she had kind of been talking about how unhappy she was with the microwave. And I don't remember what it was about the microwave, but I had this idea of like, man, she's been talking about this microwave. We were broke like the Ten Commandments at the time, but we were living on love. And so I thought, I'm going to splurge, and I'm going to buy her a microwave for our first Christmas. The girls, don't shake your head because you, you know where we're going already. You know, I'm, I'm going to write a book about husband tips and it's going to be called What Not to Do in Marriage. That's going to be my book title. And so I went and bought it and I'll never forget, I went and actually stood in line on a Black Friday. Everybody else is going for the TVs and I'm going straight for a microwave. Can you even imagine? I go there, I'm so happy, I buy it. And I go into our apartment, and our apartment has very little space where Leslie, you know, can't go. I mean, we only have one closet. It's a one-bedroom apartment. There's no storage space. And so I put it under the bed, and I told Leslie, I said, look, whatever you do, do, do not look under the bed. And how many of you are like this? Let's just take a quick vote here, kind of get the, how many of you, when you buy a gift that you're excited about, you can't wait for them to open it, and so you, like, want to tell them? Just raise your hand. Anybody like that? And how many of you keep them up? How many of you actually end up telling them? Raise your hand. Yeah, I feel you. I, we are in that boat together. And so I am like so stoked about this microwave. It actually had a setting where you could go from high power to low. I mean, it had a popcorn setting. It had like poultry setting. It was, I mean, top of the line from cons. And I should have known then by the name of the store. But anyway, um, <laughs> but that's two ends and that's different than the real con. So anyway, I bought it, told her don't look. And she's like, well, what is it? Oh, and that's like the question I hate and love because I don't want to tell her, but I do want to tell her. And so I tell her, hey, this is, this is something that you're really going to like. And she goes, oh, awesome. And I said, but do not look under the bed because you're going to ruin the surprise. And I said, you've been, and she's like, oh, well, what is it? And I said, well, it's, it's something that, you know, you, you've been talking about that you, that you really want. But, it, you know, I'm, and she said, it's not a microwave, is it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I mean, I, it was not like, it's not a microwave like you bought the cheap kind, you, I want the good kind. It was like, surely you're not dumb enough to get me a microwave. <laughs> and, I, and I did. I lied. It's a confession. I've taken it to the Lord. He's forgiven me. I lied and said no. And then I took it back. And, and anyway, I uh, got her something else. I don't remember what I got her that year. But it was not a microwave because I was not going to, on the first Christmas, have this gift that was a promise of something so great to turn out to be such a disappointment, right? Because a gift is like a promise. And we've all had experiences in our lives where someone makes us some kind of promise, whether it's a gift or they give us their word, and then they don't keep it. And when they don't keep it, it makes us feel insecure, right? It hurts us. It damages us in some way. And sometimes we've experienced where people keep their promises. And in those moments, we feel more secure about it. We, we feel at peace. And, and as we've been studying, as we started our study last week on this series, in this series called Joy, 
we looked at the promise of joy that's found in Luke chapter 2. And so I want you to open your Bible, if you have it this morning, open it to the Luke, uh, Luke the second chapter, and we're going to look again at this promise of joy. And in this announcement, you're going to find some wonderful promises from God about Jesus and his birth and the story of Christmas. And I want to pick up the story kind of in the middle of where we were last week in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, and lying in a manger. Now, I want us to just look back very quickly at verses 10 and 11, especially. Those are the verses we studied last week. And as they come up on the screen, I want us to actually kind of interact here. So if you look at Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, you'll find that the birth of Jesus is good news. That's a promise. God said to the shepherds, that I bring you good news. Every word that God speaks in the Christmas announcement is a promise. And so when God says this is good news, that's a promise from God that everything about Jesus is good news, it's not bad news. And let me just say this to you. If you've been burned by church, if Jesus and the message of the Bible is anything to you but good news, then I want to apologize to you that, that Jesus has been misrepresented to you. But Jesus and the story of his birth and his life and his death for our sins is good news. But we also see in that scripture that there's a promise of great joy. It's good news of great joy. And here's a promise for every person in this room today. It's for all the people. Jesus didn't just come for some. He came for all of the world. And so it's good news of great joy for everyone. Look at verse 11. We see some more promises. A Savior has been born, a Deliverer. And he's born in Bethlehem. And I pointed out last week that he's been born unto you. He, the angel says that to the shepherds. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He's the, Messi the Messiah. He's the supreme ruler and authority in our lives. Those are promises of the Christmas story. And then we get down to verse 12. And in verse 12, we find some promises that oftentimes when we read them, we read them as promises really only specific to the shepherds. And I think that the promises in verse 12 are actually often overlooked for us. Notice in verse 12 of Luke 2 that the angel says that you'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, right? So strips of cloth, and that's what we see when we see the nativity scene, we see the manger, you have the baby that's just wrapped in kind of strips of cloth or a blanket and oftentimes that's what it would be in those days they would just kind of sew together a, a patchwork type of blanket for the baby and then you'll find him lying in the manger but one of the most overlooked parts of the story is one that resonates with me personally and I hope that it really speaks to your heart today as the angels appear to the shepherds, they said in verse 10, it's good news of great joy for everyone. In verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. But look at the first part of verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. Do you see it? There's a promise there. That there's good news of great joy, a Savior has been born, and God has given a sign to you that what the angels have just declared is in fact true. Do you see it? This will be a sign for you. And then he, the angel says to them, and you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. We live in a culture that is increasingly secular and anti-Christian. And I'm not talking about the political state of our world. I'm talking about a mindset that there is no God and the story of Jesus is simply a fairy tale. It's made up and no different than the stories that you read to your children about talking mice, right? About a big bad wolf or any of Aesop's fables. 
That is increasingly prevalent in our culture. And every parent in this room, you better be aware that your children and the minds of your grandchildren, if you have them, are under constant assault to believe that there is no God and that any claim by Jesus that he is God is simply a made-up fairy tale. You need to know that. And the culture is relentlessly pursuing our children. But our culture is also relentlessly pursuing us. And on this first Christmas message, the Savior has been born and God makes his message known. And I love verse 12. Because this is how I think and where my faith really rests. I remember when I was in high school, and maybe you had this experience too, and some of you young people at the back. When I was in high school, I remember a couple of conversations that I had to God. And one of them was a question about my doubts. I had doubts about God and Jesus. And so I would say something to God, and I would say, God, if you're real, then just send a lightning bolt right now. You ever had those tests with God? Or God, if you're real, why don't you just speak to me? Like, let me hear your voice. And I remember telling God one time on a, on a very cloudy day, I told God, God, if you're real, make one of the clouds give me some kind of sign that you're there. And nothing happened. No lightning, no clouds forming into, hey, I'm real. Nothing. In, in the culture that we live in today, people will say that because God doesn't answer in those ways, and if God is so real, where is God? That must be evidence that there is no God. So sometimes people will say things like, if God is real, why doesn't he show himself? And when I'm having those conversations, I will often ask them this question. What would God need to do for you to prove that he's real? And the answer typically is in one of two forms. And the two forms are actually the same things that I was saying to God when I was in high school. If God would show up, you know, appear somehow, or if God would speak, then I would believe. You might have heard that same objection before. And on the first Christmas, I want you to know that God showed up and God spoke. And before that first Christmas, God had been showing up and God had been speaking. And since that first Christmas, God has continued to show up and God has continued to speak. I was having a conversation with my son, Luke. He's, a, he's 17 years old. He's a junior at Klein Kane High School. And we were talking on the way to school about skepticism and how so many people today in our culture are skeptical about Jesus. And in that conversation, he began to share with me even some of the same questions and doubts that I had about God when I was that age. And can I even say to you that some of the things about God defy what I can explain to you today? There are still, still some things about God that I do not understand, but the gap between what I can reasonably conclude about God and the faith that I need to accept some things is so small because God has showed himself, up, showed himself so many times and God continues to speak. And I told Luke, when you read the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, John chapter 11 is a perfect example. Mary and Martha are mourning the death of their, their brother Lazarus. He's been in the grave four days, and everyone who's gathered at the house of Mary and Martha know, they all know that Lazarus is dead. They were there when they wrapped his body in linen cloths and placed him in the tomb and sealed the tomb. And Jesus shows up four days later, and Jesus tells them to roll that stone away, and Jesus speaks into the tomb to Lazarus, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man walked out of that grave, bound in linen cloths, and Jesus said, unloose him. And there were people who were standing there when God spoke, and when God showed up, and Lazarus walked out of the grave, and the gospel account tells us in John chapter 11, there were people people who saw with their own eyes Lazarus walk out of that grave and they did not believe so skepticism is nothing new but here's what I want you to know today and we see it in Luke chapter 2 and verse 12 and that is that God is still speaking and God is still showing up and God has not called us to accept him blindly by faith but God tells us this is a sign for you 
There's evidence that God truly is who he said he was and that God exists. And here's the promise of Christmas. A Savior has been born for you. And that message is good news of great joy for everyone because a Savior has come. And then verse 12, the angel said to the shepherds, and you can find that joy yourself. You see it? This is a sign for you, a sign that what we are declaring about Jesus is true, but it's a sign for you, and here's the phrase, you will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth lying in a manger. In other words, the angel said to the shepherds, don't just take our word for it, you can find this Savior yourself. Now listen to the next part in verse 13. The next part of the shepherd's story. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And that's what I wanted as a high school student. God, if you're real, just show me the angels. Just say something to me. And I often wondered, what if I had told God, give me a lightning bolt and lightning would have struck? There are still people who would say, yeah, but that can be explained by the scientific laws of nature. What does God have to do to show us that he's real? And so we see in this story that God has given them a sign. God showed up with these angels and God spoke to them yet again. And then look at verse 15. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. What was their response? We've got to go see it for ourselves. My first girlfriend, ugh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, what were you doing, man? Anyway. We went to different schools, and every week when we get together at church on Sunday or youth group on Wednesday night, she would hand me a letter like this, folded like this, annoyingly. Folded over where this little tab would be. I couldn't do it right because it's so annoying. Tucked into this thing, and then to, uh, to read it, you'd have to open this thing. And she got on this thing one time where she wanted every time we met to write a 20-page letter to each other. Can you imagine anything more annoying I can't. I mean, I, I really cannot. And this is in the, if, if we had had cell phones during the day, I would be single today. I'm telling you, it was so annoying, but it was like the pressure was on. If you want to date me, I got to write a 20-page letter. And I don't have that much to say. Now, I know you don't believe that because of the, the length of my sermons, but at the time, I couldn't write 20 pages. Now, I have no problem with it. But we would we'd write these letters, and, and so we had, I had these things where, uh, oh, it's so annoying, it's so embarrassing. But I would say, okay, drop the subject. And I would use three lines. I put drop on one line, then the and subject. And that was a way that I kind of ate up some of the pages I had to write. It's so annoying. But in the days before, um, abbreviations and all the young people at the bag, it's so great that our AC's out that you get to hear this today. But we were the ones that invented abbreviations. I'm going to share some of them with you that we wrote. The first one was TCCIC. Who knows what that means? Anybody just raise your hand? Only like one person? I'm that cool, huh? We would sign our letters TCCIC, and that stands for, go ahead to the next one. Is it paused? Take care because I care. <laughs> we graduated from the letters, and we got pagers. You remember pagers? And we'd page somebody. You'd have to call the number and then enter something in the phone. And so I would type 01134. You know what that means? If you can imagine, I can't do it because I'm strong enough. I'm just not going to do it. If I flip this upside down, 01134 upside down on your page, your spells, hello. We were, I'm, basically, I need a patent on texting because I came up with all this stuff. <laughs> and then we'd write things like this, WWJD, right? What is that? What would Jesus do? That's what it became. But when we wrote it, it is, we were just dorks, okay? <laughs> that, all right, that, that one's made up. I wouldn't really write that. But in order to know what was in the letter, the 20-page, whatever you want to call it, thesis about dating, 
and about junior high life, you had to open it. You didn't just get the letter, put it in your backpack, put it on the shelf, and then just leave it there. And the truth is, is that God wants to speak to us the truth of who he is. And God has been showing up, but many of us take this book that God has given us that is where God speaks to us with his voice and we close it up and we put it in our backpack, we put it on the shelf and we expect every Sunday for the preacher to come and tell you what God has said when all weeks God's been saying, hey, I wrote the letter for you. You gotta open it. You gotta receive it for yourself. Look again at verse 15. God had spoken and they said at the end of that verse, which the Lord has made known to us. I mean, this, this message from God is unmistakable. It's unmistakably clear, unmistakably clear he has spoken to us, but their response to that was, let us go over to Bethlehem and see with our own eyes, not take someone else's word for it, but to see it for ourselves. And so many people think they're Christians because mom and dad and grandpa was Christian or because they come to a church where they're surrounded by a lot of Christian people. The shepherds didn't receive the joy of Christmas because someone told them about Jesus, they went and saw it for themselves. There had to be a response to it. And that's, in fact, what happened. And look at verse 16. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Now, I want you to just look in your Bible at verse 12 and verse 16, and I want you to see it. In verse 12, you find the promise. This will be a sign for you. You're going to find a baby in a manger. And in verse 16, what did they find? They found the baby in the manger just as God had promised. Here's the joy that we can find in Christmas. The joy that we can find in Christmas is that the promises of God are true. The promises of God never fail. His word never returns void. What God said about Jesus, that there's a baby lying in a manger, the shepherds found that to be true. And because they found that to be true, they knew that what had been proclaimed about the baby was true, that a Savior had been born for them. And he was Christ the Lord. The promises of God are true. There are so many miraculous stories about the birth of Jesus. You remember the Disney uh, show Cinderella, right? She goes to the ball, and on the way out as she's rushing out, the glass slipper falls off her foot. And Prince Charming doesn't know her name, and so he's looking throughout the whole kingdom to find Cinderella, to find his one true love that he danced with that night. And they try the shoe on all the people around the kingdom, including the wicked stepsisters. And finally, Cinderella is able to break out of the attic where she had been locked away, and the slipper fits perfectly on her feet. You know the story, right? The first 39 books of the Bible are called the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is filled with prophecies about the Savior who would come. And all of those prophecies would be fulfilled in one person. And what the Old Testament authors, really, when you look at the Bible, it's an amazing book. 40 different authors over 1,600 years from the first to the last. Many of them not knowing the other one even existed. And yet they write about the Messiah and the Savior with such perfect clarity and unification. Never a contradiction. But the Old Testament kind of paints this picture that one day the Savior is going to come. And when the Savior comes, he's going to be born here. He's going to look like this. He's going to do this. This is going to happen to him. And all of those Old Testament prophecies are like a shoe that's going to only fit one person, and that one person is Jesus. I want you to see these promises in the Old Testament. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, we find a prophecy that was written about 500 years before the time of Christ that said, when the Savior would come, he would be born in Bethlehem. And you know when that happened? Luke chapter 2 and verse 11. The time was come when they were in, in Bethlehem and Jesus Christ was born. But I want you to think about the circumstances. Micah writes, when the Savior comes, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. But here's the problem. Jesus' earthly parents aren't from Bethlehem. They're from Nazareth. You know why they got down to Bethlehem? Because a Roman emperor declared that there needed to be a census. And because of that, Joseph and Mary made the 70-mile trip down to Bethlehem. And while she was there, she gave birth to the Savior. You tell me that's a coincidence. I tell you that's God speaking and that's God showing up. In the Christmas story, we see that the promises of God are true. Hosea wrote that when the Savior, when the Son of God would come, that he would be called out of Egypt. His son would be called out of Egypt. Well, if you know anything about the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2, Herod, the Roman, Roman king in Judea, 
he declared that all the infants were to be killed after the birth of, of Jesus. And so in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13, you find God giving a word to Joseph saying, don't take your child back to Nazareth. Take your child down to Egypt for a season because Herod is going to slaughter these children in a heinous act. And because of that, that's why Jesus ended up in Egypt for a season to fulfill the prophecy that Hosea had written hundreds of years before the time of Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah prophesied that in Israel there would be weeping and wailing because of Rachel's children who were being killed, which is a, a, a foreshadow or a prophecy about the time of Herod when all the children would be killed. And of course, in Matthew 2, 16, that was fulfilled at the birth of Jesus. The lineage of Jesus. Jesus would come from the seed of Abraham, from Isaac and Jacob and Judah, Jesse and David. In fact, when you read Matthew chapter 1, you get to one of those parts of scriptures that for most of us, they're kind of boring, right? This person begat this person, begat this person, begat this person. But go back and read Matthew 1, the first 18 verses, and you will find God tracing the story of Jesus all the way back to Abraham. When God made the promise to Abraham, from you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And all of these circumstances led Jesus to be born from the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jesse, all lined up perfectly. And let me tell you, in all the history of the world, there's only been one person that fit all of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, and his name is Jesus. He's the Savior of the world. He's Christ the Lord. All those prophecies in the Old Testament tell us that the promises of God are true. If you want the most miraculous, it's Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, that a virgin will conceive and bear a son and will call his name Emmanuel, which we know later is God with us. And Matthew chapter 1 verse 24 says, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The virgin birth of Jesus is a miracle that cannot be explained by science. But when you look at the mountain of scientific and archaeological and historical evidence for the veracity of the Christmas story, that Jesus was in fact born to be the Savior of the world, then we can believe that God superimposed his will upon a woman and gave birth to a son who was the Son of God. A virgin conceived, and she gave birth to a son, and his name is Jesus. And he came to save his people from their sins. Every word of the announcement of the birth of Jesus is true. And every word of this book is true. When you read the poetry, the truths that it claims in poetic form are true. When you read the history, you can know that time and again, archaeologists and historical uh, uh, scholars have affirmed the veracity or the validity of the word of God. When you read a promise from God, you can know that what God says is going to happen is true. And that's where we find joy we find joy in the fact that God's word and his promises are true. Turn to Galatians chapter 4, and I'll begin to wrap this up. Galatians chapter 4. One of the great passages of the Christmas story is not found in any of the gospel accounts, but notice Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. Paul writes this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Sent a son. He was born of a woman, which means Jesus was God, but he was fully human. God was his father, conceived by the Holy Spirit, but born, made of a woman, and made under the law, meaning made under the requirements of the Old Testament law. And he had to fulfill all of those to prove that he was the son of God. And that's why Jesus, while he lived, never sinned. He never violated the word of God. He was born under the law. But notice in verse four, uh, verse five, what Paul says to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus was born under the law and lived a perfect life, and he lived a perfect life and died on the cross, was buried and rose again to redeem you who had broken the law and to adopt you into his family as a son. In 2015, my family traveled to China to adopt a little girl. And when we adopted Ellie, her name was immediately changed from I Jing Fu to Eliana Joy Jing Pollard. She became ours the moment that she was adopted into our family. And if you've been redeemed by Christ, you need to know that you took his name, that he became your father. And then in the promise of Christmas, it's not just the promise of a savior, but it's a promise to be a part of the family of God. 
God sent Jesus at the perfect time to receive us and adopt us into his family. Notice in verse 6 of Galatians 4. And because you are sons, because you've been adopted as sons, God has sent his spirit into his son, of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. When we adopted Ellie, she called me Baba for the first couple of months. That's the Chinese word for dad or Mandarin word for dad. And there was a day when Ellie was playing with Adam at the, at the table and they were doing something. I don't remember what happened, but Adam called me from across the room. He said, Daddy, can you come help me? And I went over and helped him with whatever he was doing. And Ellie, who had always called me Baba before that time, as I was walking away, she said, Daddy? But it was a question mark. And I turned around. I fought back the tears like I'm doing now because I want to go three for three this week. But I turned around and, I, and she just kind of rattled off some stuff in Mandarin. And I helped her with what she wanted help with and kissed her on the head and walked away. And from that point forward, she never called me Baba again. It was always Daddy. That was our time. That was our moment when she realized, I'm not just a kid that's been adopted into my family. This is my dad. And I can say, Abba, Father. And any person who places their faith in Christ, Paul says, that perfect son who was born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we could be adopted into his family and his spirit lives inside of us and we can come to him and no longer call him father, but Abba, father. A term of endearment and a term that tells us we can call out to him for anything that we need. And in verse seven, Paul writes, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. When God calls me home, my kids are going to have access to our 2013 Suburban. All the riches of the Pollard name. One of them is going to get my barbecue pit. They're going to get our recipe for mac and cheese. I have all my sermon notes. What a gift. What a gift. In fact, I think I'm going to do that for Christmas this year, to wrap up one of my sermons like, here you go, be blessed. <laughs> and take pictures of their faces as they're unwrapping. They're like, really, Dad? Everything about the Christmas story is good news of great joy. And look at chapter 2 of Luke's gospel, verse 20. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. They heard God speak, and they saw God show up. And you know why they did? Because when they received the word from God about this Savior, they made a response. They responded, and they said, we have got to go see this thing for ourselves. Listen, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then today you've heard the message that a Savior has been born. And today needs to be the day that you make haste, and you in your heart peer into the manger, and you see Jesus laying there, just as the angel said. And in your heart, you realize that Savior that had been promised, it's true. He really came, and he's the Savior of the world, and he was born to be my Savior. And today, right where you're sitting today, you can peer into that manger in your heart and place your faith in Jesus. And when you do, that moment that you place your faith in Jesus, you are adopted in the family of God and you become a son of God and an heir, not just a son, but an heir to all that is the riches of God and his fullness. Maybe today needs to be that day for you. And if you've done that in your heart, I just want to share with you verse 17 and verse 18 of Luke chapter 2. When the shepherds saw for themselves Jesus, do you know what they did? They went out and told everybody they could about what they had seen and what they had heard. They went out and they told people, look, we were out on the hill, so this, this is me, this way I would tell it, dude, I was at work last night. You're never gonna believe it. An angel appeared. It was amazing just out of nowhere and it was real. I was trying to touch it. I mean, it's a, that's how I would tell the story. And they told us about this baby that had been born and just what the angel said, it was true. We went and we saw that baby for ourselves and I knew in that moment that the Savior, the Christ, the Lord had, had, had come and that the word of God and the promises of God, they're true. And what's amazing in verse 18 is what we find in verse 18 is that the people, when they heard the testimony of the shepherds, they wondered about what the shepherds were telling them. One of the lies the enemy has convinced us of in, in this culture that we live in is just stay quiet about Jesus because people don't want to know. The truth is they want to know. And if they don't even know that they want to know, they need to know about the Savior who's come. And God has placed you in their life to tell them the good news of great joy that's for them, that a Savior has been born for them. And some might receive the message and stay on the hillside of Bethlehem and never go see it for themselves. But there are some that you're going to give that message to and they're 
going to wonder at what you're saying. And they're going to peer into that manger at some point in their lives and they're going to believe it to be true. I'm standing here as a pastor today because there was a pastor in Houston in a small little Baptist church that came and visited my mom and dad. Excuse me, my mom, I'm not choked up. All right, that was just a, don't, no, that's not a cry. No tears. Came to visit my mom and dad and invited them to church and they went to church and from that point forward, never turned back. And my dad became a pastor and, and trained us to love Jesus and to follow him. And I'm standing before you today because someone shared the message of Jesus with them and they wondered at what had been told to them. And then they found it for themselves and never looked back. So take it, church. Take it to those at your workplace, to your friends. Invite them to church. Tell them to watch online. Tell them about Christmas under the stars. Tell them about Jesus, whatever it takes. Let's share this good news of great joy that's for everyone. We can take joy today that the promises of God are true. Do you believe it today? Can you celebrate with me in that today? Amen. Let's stand together and celebrate together. Let me just pray with you, and then we're going to worship God together. Father, we thank you for the promises that you made. We thank you that your word is true. We thank you that the promises that you make to us are true, that on that first Christmas, a Savior was born. And we rejoice in that, God, that your word never returns void. And maybe, maybe God, there's someone right here in this room today that's struggling with their faith. They don't know, and they don't know if they believe or they have doubts about the truth of Jesus in the Bible. Today, I pray that in their hearts, they would see anew the miraculous word that you've given to show us that Jesus was prophesied about and all of those prophecies were fulfilled perfectly in Jesus. God, we know that's not a coincidence. That's you saying to us today, this is a sign for you that you can find the truth of Jesus for yourself. And I pray if there's someone that's struggling with their faith, today would be the day in their hearts they place their faith in Christ. And Father, as believers, give us the boldness and courage of the shepherds to take this good news of great joy to everyone that we know. Help us to share it without shame, without fear, with great courage. And let us tell the world that a Savior has been born and it's good news of great joy for them. Give us that faith, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.